Joining me today is the author of several books and the founder and current president of the David Horowitz Freedom Center. David Horowitz, welcome to The Rubin Report. Thank you, Dave. What are the chances that you ended up being the president of a place called the David Horowitz Freedom Center? That is, that is incredible. I, I actually fought that name, but, <laughs> but my board said uh, I, had, I had named it the Center for the Study of Popular Culture. As a, as a leftist, I thought it's a very hard to attack. A, a center for studying anything, let alone just, but, but conservatives see the word culture and they think left. So that, and that was just confusing. So yeah. they made me, I said, gotta put your name on it, so. So here we are. All right, yeah. so I don't know in the years that I've been doing this show that I've read anyone's bio and found it more interesting than your bio. It was, at least not someone that was born in the United States. I thought it was just, there's so much richness there, your evolution, Politically, it has a lot to do with some of the things that you write about, about going from the left to the right and all that. Um, so I want to start with your history first. Your parents were communists. Card-carrying. Card-carrying Everybody communists. We... Not communists like the communists that kids that think it's cool today. Right. We're talking old no, no, school these communists. Are, these, are, these are people who are part of a, a vast international conspiracy orchestrated by Moscow. Um, my parents, my, 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 I don't think my mother ever got a traffic ticket. They, they were very middle class, not break the law. Um, but they did hide an East German communist in the basement who, who the government wanted to deport. Uh, How did he get to your basement? I have no idea, I was very young. Uh, <laughs> did you know there was someone down there? I mean, did you know yeah. something was oh, going Dieter on? Dieter was his name, I yeah. forgot the last name. His brother was the mayor of East Berlin. <laughs> okay. Um, but, um, yeah, they were very conspiratorial. Um, they never referred to themselves as communists, only as progressives. Even then? Because it wasn't a dirty... No, because, well, oh, it was very dirty. It, it, it was, was a dirty word It was a very healthy but, period, but, um, because this anti-American left, very subversive, ready to work with the, our enemies, the, so, you know, a, a horrible totalitarian dictatorship were effectively quarantined. We lived in a kind of ghetto where you couldn't say what you, what you believed. Now that, for a Democrat or with a small d, for a liberal-minded uh, person, that doesn't seem right, but it was actually healthy given the Cold War at the time. So, so, so what did it mean at that time? You need at to have time. a stigma on people who hate this country. Yeah. And we, we've lost that completely. So, so we'll get to that part, because that really yeah. sort of, that gets to the evolution part yeah. of where you're at so now. So then we were stigmatized. And, uh, but what did they believe? Like, what did that actually mean? If you said you were a communist in, you know, we're talking the 1940s now. I, nothing, my mother was a registered Democrat. Um, I don't think anything different from certainly not the Democratic Party of today. Although then, I mean, when Roosevelt was president, they were all, happy Democrats, when Truman um, declared that uh, America would defend free peoples fighting for their freedom against the Soviet Union, they all defected and then formed the Progressive Party, which was run by the Communist Party. Yeah, and then around 1956, if I'm not mistaken, all the information well, that, comes out about Stalin, and then well, that sort of... Right, that was my, away. I was 17 at the time, and that was my kind of awakening that Everything that the William Buckley's that we hated, the right, that the right said, the right said Stalin had killed seven million people. He actually killed about 40 million. Um, and we said was, this was all anti-Soviet lies. The Soviet Union was a, a paradise of the future. Everybody equal, everybody working, everybody happy. All lies, but we, my community believed them. And then Khrushchev came along with this, uh, gave a secret speech that the Israeli Mossad smuggled out. And it just, it blew up my community that there were divorces in our, that you know, we knew of, uh, over people dividing over the Khrushchev report. People felt betrayed, they had lived a lie. And other people felt, you know, you continue, you go on, and they defended it. Yeah. And that, that made marriages untenable. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> right. You think it's tough yeah. now for marriages yeah. when people are going, "I love Trump, I hate Trump," but but that's so that's, I, that's earth-shaking stuff. Your whole narrative. 
Yes. So I came into the, when I went to college, I mean, my mission, self, self developed, um, was to rescue the left from Stalinism. Um, I still believed in this future where every, you know, common uh, government ownership of the means of production and equality and everything. Um, and so I, I was a fervent new leftist. I was one of the, actually one of the creators of the new left. I was at Berkeley. Um, we published a magazine called Root and Branch. And, uh, but by the end of that decade, it was clear the left was a totalitarian force. It couldn't, it, it, it was supporting, uh, you know, whatever was the man of Maoists. They were Maoists. Mao killed more people than Stalin. Um, and uh, so you saw that change from what you thought yeah. was something decent. You saw that basically right. anything related to uh, authoritarianism would be sort of pieced into this. My, my most, I had two serious deviations. I had a nuclear family and everybody else was living in communes or whatever. Um, but the more serious one was that I read books. So <laughs> I... <laughs> I, mean, I remember when Billy Ayers uh, was elected vice president when the weather people took over SDS. This is a, a, a college senior. He boasted that he hadn't read a book in a year. I was horrified as a leftist <laughs> by that statement. Um, but what was, so I, I his argument was, what, I'm not being programmed by these people? No, but they, no, he was an irresponsible twit. I mean, it's, you know, came from wealth. Very, you know, privileged. Uh, I have, I have nothing good to say about Billy Ayers. Uh, but by saying I, I haven't read a book in a year, who is he? How is he trying to impress somebody? By he's that? trying to impress. Well, because the books are written by the ah. uh, ruling class or whatever. Gotcha. Did, what did Marx say? The ruling ideas are the uh, ideas of the ruling class. Completely false. How would you explain our universities today? <laughs> and, uh, Marx is full of crap. I mean, right. that's the first thing you have to. Yeah, well, we'll get to our universities. Don't worry about that. But wait a minute. The first one you mentioned there was you came from a nuclear family, and that was then a problem. You I had a nuclear family. Yeah. Oh, you had your own nuclear My family own. at I that had, time. Okay. Had, but uh, you also came from a nuclear family. By the family. end of the decade, I had four children, yeah. Yeah. So and why then, was that a problem for them? Because they want... Uh, they didn't, I wasn't expelled from the left. I, 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 I was, um, well, th what happened to me was that I, I, I edited Ramparts, which was the leading, it was the biggest magazine of the left. And uh, a Hollywood producer, producer of Easy Rider, um, was a big uh, funder and sponsor of the Black Panther Party, and he, he introduced me to Huey Newton because he wanted me to take, Eldridge Cleaver had been on our masthead. Uh, and Eldridge, there was a war, it was basically a, Black Panther Party is a, a street gang. And uh, this was a contest for leadership. Um, so he, uh, he introduced me and I, I got involved raising money for the Panthers. I raised for a school. Um, I was very impressed. They had a lot of children. And the Panther Party was a mix. There were, uh, you know, genuinely good people and there were gangsters. Um, and the good people impressed me. And uh, one of them was running the school, a school, and they were jammed into a, uh, a brown shingle house in, uh, in Oakland. I mean, they, they had double decker beds from one wall to the other. Wow. For the kids, so I, um, I thought this Hollywood producer would give me the money, but it, it didn't turn out that way. I, but I raised, oh, I think it was one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, which is a lot of money in those days, and bought a church, a Baptist church in East Oakland that had been overtaken by the uh, inner city. It was a white Baptist church, and I, and I, I signed up the check. Um, I created the Oakland Community Learning Center, a 501c3 to house the school. I'll never forget the, uh, the minister said to me as I handed him the check, I hope you're not going to turn this over to the Black Panthers or the Nation of Islam. 
Did he no. know who, that you were working with them at all at the time? Uh, with the Black no. Panthers? No. He had no idea, so no. he was literally jo no joking idea. to you. Like most of the left today, I had no idea who they were, the Panthers. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I've told this story in a Radical Son, my autobiography. Anyway, in, in uh, 1974, I, I recruited the bookkeeper, my bookkeeper at Ramparts, to do the books for the school because I believed our own propaganda that the government was racist and that they would shut down the Panthers if they didn't keep the books, which was ridiculous. I mean, look at Jesse Jackson, look at Al Sharpton. I mean, he's a huge tax evader. Yeah. And he's walking the streets because he's progressive and black, he's protected. Um, and in December 1974, uh, Betty disappeared. And by the time the police fished her body out of San Francisco Bay, I knew the Panthers had killed her. I, I had been interviewed by the police. They explained to me lots of things. It's very difficult to, high, to dispose of a body unless you have an organization, and then it's not so hard. You have safe houses and this and that. Um, and so when that happened, um, I was personally devastated. I mean, I was in the same place my parents were yeah. being embarrassed by the Khrushchev report something I swore that I, would never happen to me. Um, and I, I I'm went, curious, were, were your parents around at the time? Yeah, my mother was very, they were worried for my safety, as they should be. I was threatened by uh, Elaine Brown, who was the head of the Panthers, and is alive today, um, toasted by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and uh, funded by actually conservatives uh, often not always, hmm. to speak on college campuses. Um, she was the head of the party. Uh, Wait, why would conservatives fund her now? Has she evolved? I forget early? that, what's the name of this, a big Orange County Foundation. They gave her $10,000 to speak at, uh, I can't remember, it was UC Santa Barbara. Huh. I was, the students there informed me. No, because uh, uh, conservatives in this country are, are, are well-meaning, uh, liberal-minded people, generally, especially the ones with money, um, give you the benefit of the doubt. I mean, here's a black person claiming that America is an oppressive country. Oh, sure, here's some money. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I was personally devastated. I was clinically, I would say, clinically depressed for seven or eight years. I mean, I wake up in tears every morning. I felt responsible for having recruited Betty. Uh, her name was Betty Van Patter, the woman who was murdered. She was the mother of three children. Um, th the ideology is so pernicious that on the way to, the, to Betty's funeral, her daughter, who worked for me and was, I don't know if she was 19 or 20 at the time, I tried to warn her. I mean, I was afraid for my children but I said, I think the Panthers killed your mother. And her response was, no, they're good people. So, so I set out then to warn, when I had sort of assimilated all this, uh, I, I, my mission was to warn other people. And that's how I know that Barack Obama is a communist. All right, so wait, let's, let's pause before we jump to, to modern day. Because everything that you just described there was why I thought your bio was so interesting. Yeah. Because you grow up with communists, you know. Now I didn't I'm know about the guy. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know about the guy in the basement. But you, I mean, you you are firmly on the left. Your whole first forty some odd years. Uh, I was were, a Marxist. I wrote yeah. a book called Empire and Revolution, which the left used. Right. So leftist, communist, Marxist. I mean, so yeah. Paul Berman, for example. Yeah. Um, said of the of, of my book that it was like a I don't know what he said a handbook a bible for the for the left before he called me a renegade <laughs> for leaving the left right right so that's so you're you're a hero but the second you now change now of course if you deviate from the party line this yeah. is what political people don't realize political correctness is a term that Mao Zedong the greatest mass murderer in human history invented to shut people up it's the party line. If you deviate from the party line, they throw you into the cold. Yeah. All right. So now we're, let's flash forward, unless there's something or major. Or shoot you. Or, or shoot you, right. So they, they shoot, first they silence are. you, yeah. then they shoot you, you know. Uh, 
so unless I'm missing something, I think we can flash forward now to around 85, which is really when you then That's said. That's right. Um, what happened was, when this happened, I was writing, I, I had um, left Ramparts with Peter Collier, who was my buddy. Uh, and uh, it was Peter's idea that w to write a, a, a dynastic biography. Uh, the, the Goldsworthy saga was on PBS at the time, or so it was a generational saga. So I was in the midst of writing a book on the Rockefellers, which became a bestseller. And then we were asked to do a book on the Kennedys, which came out in 1985. And, uh, in 19, and, and uh, at, when it came out, it was a number one New York Times bestseller. And uh, the Washington Post, the editor of the Washington Post Sunday Magazine called me to pick my brain about young Joe Kennedy, who was a congressman. And he said, what have you guys been doing? I said, oh, you won't believe this, but Peter and I just voted for Ronald Reagan. And neither Peter and I had talked before casting that vote. Wow. Oh, that's a good story. You want to write it? So our story was better run than read, but he renamed it Lefties for Reagan. Right. So then, And that's when the knives came out. And Peter said to me at the time, i just show you how deep the current rot, the fake news is. Um, we were front page New York Times. Mm -hmm. uh, both books, both the Rockefellers and, and Sunday Times. And the New York Times sets the standard for all the media. They even re reprint the mm -hmm. reviews. But, um, and when our article came out on uh, we voted for Reagan, Peter said to me, our literary careers are over. Wow. I said, you must be joking. I mean, <laughs> So you really had no idea. I had no you idea. Wrote this well, thing. I would, Even though you knew some of the tactics. And, but it was exactly right. That was yeah. the end. I don't, my last 20 books, I've been, I've, the New York Times, they noticed one and called me a relic for using the word <laughs> communist. <laughs> and it was just a squib. Right. So even though you knew all the tactics that could be coming down your way and the way you'd be treated. I've never and, been a realist about that. That's so, you, so that's it. You just weren't a realist in your own, even though you saw, you had such a history of seeing what would happen. Yeah, not that Parents and communism, Black no, Panther. No, I can never believe that people um, can be, you know, so ideological and so duped and I should know. Yeah. I think I'm suffering from a little of this right now yeah. when I'm meeting, the rubber's meeting the road with me at the moment yeah. of, of yeah, this kind so of stuff. But what, but what was it about, was it something about Reagan or was it really about Mondale? It was Reagan. Yeah. It was, uh, th this happened earlier. Um, I bumped in, uh, into the parking lot of the Berkeley Co-op, uh, which is a supermarket that was, we, everybody liked because it was a cooperative. Um, when I, Rolling Stone actually published a story that Peter and I did on the weather, the weather underground, telling the truth about it. Um, and uh, this woman I knew met me in the parking lot and she said, David, you know, people really hate you now. <laughs> and so the truth about these crazy terrorists is what they were, who got people killed. <laughs> and they hate you, now they, they hate you. They hate me for, for saying the truth about it. Yeah, but, but what was it about Reagan also that then... They that hated Reagan the way they hate Trump. Yeah. Well, it was the same kind of hatred. Which they, is, they pick out, they just hate, it's, it's because he's, he's not one of us. It's, it's very visceral. Yeah, is it's that what it is more irrational. than anything ironically? Yeah, I, that I, for the media, I, he's not one of them? You know, he was an act, that, and, you know, he, I, I don't know. I, the, the Trump phenomenon and problem is a little different, but it's, it's not all that different. I mean, Reagan was an actor that they looked down on that. Um, you know, um, von Mises wrote a pamphlet called the, uh, an essay, which is a pamphlet called The Anti-Capitalist Mentality. Why do academics um, hate capitalism? Why are they so left? And the answer is because they feel superior to businessmen. And here's Trump, the businessman. Mm -hmm. uh, businessmen are yahoos. <laughs> they have no respect 
for what it takes to build a billion dollar empire. And for them, it's all theft or something uh, underhanded. It's, it's theft or it's crony capitalism yeah. or so something. Reagan yeah, so Reagan was like that. He was an actor. How dare he be president? We're so much smarter than he is. We should be running the country. So intellectuals, I think it was about intellectuals. Generally, they don't. They they feel that they're smarter than everybody else. Right, because they and, haven't actually created for the most part. And, so they have to sort of elevate. Well, they them. want the pad. They think the power should go to them. And yeah. I learned very early when I was still a leftist, when Jack Kennedy was assassinated, and Lyndon Johnson became president. I was living in England, and of course, Europeans looked out on Americans from the beginning of the Republic, but. Um, uh, LBJ, he had the LBJ cufflinks and the LBJ children and the LBJ dogs and the LBJ, uh, you know. With, so they they just thought he was, this is a Yahoo, this is a, a, you know. And Johnson was much smarter than Jack Kennedy. He, he went to East Texas State Teachers College but he, he, unfortunately, he put in place the Great Society, which is an albatross on America's neck, has been for lo these, this half century. But he was smart. He knew how to get it through Congress, and Jack Kennedy couldn't get any of it through. Yeah, and now Congress barely works. So, so. that's why when Trump came along, I, I wasn't one of these never trumping inside the Beltway snobs, although some of my my good friends went down that path.